Okay, well, welcome to the uh, last session of the day here. And we're going to take a little bit of a different turn for this. This is going to be a, a, a session that's really focused on industry. And it kind of strikes me, if you remember from some of the previous, kind of rehashing some of the things that happened throughout the conferences, do you remember the number of uh, 100 cubic meters per day per person? And that was a number showed earlier for industrial process water use worldwide on average. And a, I guess a way to kick this off is to say, well, this group is going to be really focusing on that 100 number and what's being done to reduce that water usage. So uh, an interesting way to kick it off. And I also want to remind you from uh, Ashlyn's presentation from the other day where she went through and talked about the amount of water usage for different, you know, different types of power generations. So again, uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today is from the industrial perspective, what can we do to really make impact in this area? And we're very lucky because the first speaker we have is from here at U of I, uh, Benito, uh, Benito uh, Moranas. Uh, he's head of the uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering Department here at U of I. And uh, he's a professor of envir in the Environmental Engineering and Science Program as well as director of the Sl Safe Global Water Institute here on campus, which is one of the major institutes we have. And his, re his research is on various mechanistic aspects of chemical and ultraviolet light disinfectant processes and membrane technologies for controlling waterborne pathogens. And I know in particular Benito and I were talking and he's done a fair amount of work uh, with uh, MWRD up in Chicago. So I think you'll find it very interesting. His presentation talking about uh, what can be done to really address some of these issues from a public health perspective. So Benito. Thank you very much, Kevin. And, uh, you know, maybe I, I'll make a small correction here to your introduction that uh, even if we're going to be focused more on the industrial side, mine will be a little bit of an academic uh, presentation, though uh, it will be related to my interactions with the industry so, uh, and some of the challenges that I have found out there. Uh, but uh, before doing that, uh, I, I, uh, I wanted to say that I'm also going to be presenting work that has been in collaboration with many uh, uh, of uh, our colleagues and students uh, in the Say Global Water Institute and some of the work that we're doing uh, internationally. So I will acknowledge them uh, toward the end. But I always you know, like to, uh, our students always remind us of the challenge that we face globally in the world. So I just wanted to do a summary of something that you probably already heard many times, but uh, from a water perspective, uh, we're just now, this year, uh, reaching the 25-year challenge for the UN Millennium Development Goals, as you know. And, uh, you know, we have certain, uh, you know, some level of success, some level of not so much success. And then uh, some success that we, at least those of us working in water quality engineering, sort of question a little bit. And, and this is important as we look at this and now we move into the next phase of providing safe uh, water, uh, you know, around the world. But as you know, you know, the goal one, target one C, uh, I decided to put it up here because, uh, you know, 25 years ago, there were in the order of uh, 1 billion people or 23% percent of the population at that time that uh, were suffering from hunger. So, and the goal, of course, was, uh, in, so if you go to, to the progress that we had underneath there, the prediction now is that we're going to have uh, roughly a little less than a billion people. But in terms of percentage of the population, that's going to be 12.9%. So we're, we, we're not going to meet the goal, but we're going to be very close to uh, dropping by half that percentage. So a lot of, uh, a lot of people that uh, are still uh, out there. And this is important from a water perspective as a discussion that we have in previous sessions, of course, because uh, many of these folks are living in areas where there is water scarcity. So, uh, but I'm going to be concentrating more on goal seven, uh, target 7C that you have there, which is the one that deals with providing safe drinking water and basic sanitation. In uh, um, 1990, uh, we have 1.3 billion people or 24% of the population at that time that uh, did not have access to safe drinking water. 
And if you go down to the progress, then what we find is that uh, today we have uh, a significant lower number and actually becomes like 9% of the population that uh, do not have access, but we change the word from safe to improve uh, in that analysis. I'm going to address that, but you know, from the point of view of the goal is considered that we have met the goal. We have less than half of the percentage of people in the world, a quite significant uh, achievement. The one that has not been met is the sanitation. There were, uh, in 1990, 2.7 billion people um, in the order of a uh, little over half of the population in the world that didn't have access to basic sanitation. So and, uh, today, the number is a little lower. It's 2.4 billion. Of course, the population grew, so it's only 33% uh, of the world population. Uh, but you know, it's just still staggering to think that uh, we have uh, in the order of, for example, one billion people practicing open defecation. And this has a very strong impact on the point that I just made earlier of safe versus improved water. When we improve the water uh, in terms of what we do to do that, um, if you're in an area that the sanitation problem has not been resolved, chances are that you're going to have be drinking water that may have been improved, but not uh, necessarily uh, uh, be safe. So, and the numbers that this is an estimate or a guesstimate that in addition to the 660 million people that do not have access to improved water, so uh, there's one billion more that drink unsafe water from improved sources. That's, that's a prediction that has been done recently, a, a year ago. Uh, and uh, uh, if, you, if you add those two up, uh, they're not too far off from the 2.3 billion that do you know, don't have adequate sanitation. Where you don't have sanitation, chances are that your water sources are going to be contaminated, uh, or a big part of your water sources are going to be contaminated. So uh, there is a big overlap in there. Without solving the sanitation problem, it's going to be very challenging to address the safe water in access to safe water. So, of course, this, uh, uh, you know, we all know what this does uh, in terms of morbidity and mortality. Uh, in particular, mortality is, you know, like a little less than a million deaths and only that relates to um, diarrheal disease that connects to water. Um, but the immense majority of those are children under the age of five. This happens in many places in the world. Uh, it happens in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Southeast Asia mainly, but also in Latin America. And even in places like the United States, some of our students in the past has been working with some, for example, some of the um, poorest uh, uh, tribes, uh, uh, you know, Native American tribes in, in the U.S. And you have some of the statistics there. And they have access to improved water. That water is not necessarily safe whatsoever, as uh, we were able to test when we were in this location. So it's something that to a very small portion of our population, it also had those conditions. Now, with this setting, I now would like to come back to uh, the topic of my presentation. Since you know, I'm an engineer and I've been working with you know globally, um, I have identified since that you know we face in the United States, but since that we are also facing when we go to uh, developing countries to try to provide safe drinking water under the challenge, uh, challenging conditions that sanitation uh, is is not in good shape in these places. So uh, we use what we call disinfection processes, uh, and they protect us against the acute toxicity of pathogens, pathogens that get people sick, pathogens that are responsible for killing you know, those 800,000 uh, children that I was talking about uh, earlier. Uh, so, uh, but at the same time, you know, we're also worried about uh, sometimes putting disinfectants and disinfection technologies in contact with waters that are heavily contaminated with other things. Because then we're going to be producing, we're going to have a lot of byproduct reactions, and we produce something that we call disinfection byproducts, DBPs, that you have in there. And, and these are actually also going to affect uh, health. Typically, they don't have acute toxicity, the majority of them. It's actually a case of chronic toxicity. Many years drinking water that has this in it uh, are, uh, you know, uh, could become a problem and, you know, cancer rates could go up. And, and that's something that we control in the United States because we have demonstrated that there is a connection there. So in reality, when we do this infection, it's very important that we protect first and foremost for the acute toxicity of pathogens. But we also always think, at least at the university level, when we think about new technologies, we should be thinking about balancing, you know, optimi optimizing uh, also uh, so that we don't do, you know, have problems with the chronic toxicity of DVPs. 
So a major barrier to uh, toward doing this is, is, you know, we're dealing with something that is very complex. These waters that are contaminated, or maybe, maybe even the waters that we use in the U.S. that has the organic matter that comes from the decomposition of plants and animals in nature. Uh, so when you put a disinfectant there, uh, no matter what technology it is, there are all kinds of different reactions that we don't understand uh, well and uh, they're, they're quite complex, um, both reacting the reaction with the pathogens, we're still advancing that knowledge, the reaction with L, the uh, background uh, substances that you have in that water. And we know even less about what are the effects, primarily when we talk about chronic toxicity, what do these things, when we ingest over a lifetime of drinking water with those things, and what do they do to our body, the toxicity uh, inside the, the, the human body. So what this complexity, uh, complexity has done is that uh, we have experts that know about toxicity, that are trying to advance toxicity, experts that advance the knowledge about disinfection by products and then pathogens, and they tend to isolate themselves. The scientists that do work in one area, for example, I just came back from a Gordon conference that was specifically looking at DVP, disinfection by product control, uh, with, and they forgot totally that the whole reason why we form DVPs in drinking water is that we are trying to control the pathogens. So the, the strategies that they were proposing to minimize DVP formation didn't make any sense from the perspective of actually controlling the pathogen. So uh, we need to have more of a holistic uh, approach uh, in doing this, um, and that's where engineering uh, comes in, in my perspective. So I, I'm going to make a couple of arguments um, about integrating uh, these, these two uh, uh, goals of when we do uh, disinfection. And uh, uh, I'll give you two case studies, one that is uh, uh, case one is important in the United States as well as the developing world. In the United States, uh, uh, as you know, chlorine, uh, what we call chlorine, is the main disinfectant that we still use. But there is a big switch that is going from what we call free chlorine. Free chlorine is essentially bleach, uh, that's the form, uh, to form something that we call combined chlorine. We put a little bit of ammonia there and a little bit of excess with respect to the chlorine. They react together and form another form of chlorine that is actually quite different as a chemical. It's still a disinfectant. And, uh, so uh, we do that uh, by design. Engineering is behind it in the United States very accurately. Uh, when you go to places like uh, the developing world, what happens is the ammonia is there to start with because there is no uh, sanitation. And therefore, when you put chlorine, chances are that you're going to be forming combined chlorine sometimes. Uh, at least uh, when, when the ammonia is present there. So I want to address two things here. I want to address uh, how this will affect, for example, viruses, which are probably some of the pathogens that concern us the most because of the variability of this disinfectant. And I will also talk briefly about mycobacterium avian just to give you a view of some of the challenges that we face, both in the US and the developing world. Now, very briefly, without, I'm going to be doing less chemistry and more microorganisms uh, today, but I would like to give you a little bit of background if I had time. So uh, the uh, disinfection by products that we regulate in most places in the world, including the United States, are the two groups that you have at the very top there. And these are things that when you put chlorine in water, free chlorine, the main disinfectant that we still use in the US, uh, they're, going, they're going to react, chlorine is going to react with the natural organic matter that you have in all natural waters. It's always there at different amounts. And it's going to break it down and end up forming chemicals like what you have there, trihalomethanes, the four that we are regulating, and haloacetic acid. There are more than five that you form, but we regulate only five of them. And you also have the other regulation that we had today. Utilities cannot supply water that will exceed those numbers according to a certain method of sampling that they, they give you in the regulations. Now, these disinfection by products are associated primarily to free chlorine. So this is making the utilities go to putting ammonia there, combining the chlorine. Many of them that have the problem I cannot meet the regulation. And when you do that, uh, you have monochloramine is the main species form. You have it there as uh, when we combine free chlorine with ammonia. And you can also form it with organic nitrogen, uh, primarily in the developing world where you have a lot of organic matter from lack of sanitation. And then you're going to form these uh, other types, many, and give you an example, these haloacetamides. And the question is, haloacetamides here are not regulated, but uh, so the utilities go and switch the disinfection because then they will meet the regulations. They won't form the ones from free chlorine as much, and they will uh, form these other ones that are not regulated, so they meet the regs. So, uh, is this a problem? And the answer is yes. We start to see that probably it's going to be a problem. It probably will take us you know, a couple decades to figure out that it was not a good idea to make this switch. The initial data that we have Michael Pleva, many of you may know him in our 
you know, Department of Crop Sciences. His, his research is on disinfection by prog and drinking water, the toxicity. And Michael had shown that I'm showing you a comparison there in the chart in the corner that shows the haloacetic acids, the, the more toxic of the two regulated today. Uh, THMs are less toxic. And he has those bars, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details. as a to two types of toxicity analysis, uh, genome cytotoxicity that he's doing. But I'd like you to go to the bar on acetamides that you have there, and there are others, uh, that uh, the, the, the uh, uh, horizontal scale is a log scale. So we're really actually talking about one to two order of magnitude more toxicity associated with this analysis uh, to the haloacetamides compared to the ones that we had regulated. So the question is, are we really doing the right thing? Well, you know, of course, saying that, you know, as cyton genotoxicity, how that connects to increasing cancer rates in society, well, that's a big stretch, right? Something that probably we shouldn't be saying that this is absolutely wrong what we're doing, but this is an anticipation that as we keep advancing the knowledge on toxicity, it looks like there is a possibility that we're going to actually regret making the switch that we're making today. And of course, you know, what we do is trying to understand how we form these things and try to then uh, control that in our water control uh, process. I'm not going to go into that chemistry right now. But one thing that is also important that uh, goes even beyond, uh, you know, what I just expressed, certain chemicals, is that uh, when you use monochloramine, uh, there are two constituents that you need, uh, you probably have in most waters at different levels, bromide and iodide, they're just constituents, there's nothing wrong with them in principle, but they react with that monochloramine to produce what we call secondary oxidizing agents, which then iodinate and brominate those byproducts that I was talking about that has more genotoxicity. So, and then what you're going to find in the graph there, Michael Pleva has shown, that iodinated disinfection byproducts are significantly more toxic than brominated and more than the chlorinated. And it is combined chlorine or monochloramine, the one that does that. So uh, once again, are we, not only we are producing nitrogenous disinfection byproducts like the amides that I showed before, but we have a stronger tendency compared to free chlorine, free chlorine does much less of this uh, to uh, iodinated, for example. So, and therefore the toxicity is going to go up. So with this background, without getting into more details on, on the chemistry and toxicity, I now like to take you to the other side of the fence in which uh, what happens when we switch from free chlorine to, to uh, combined chlorine with, for example, viruses. And I had two examples here just to show uh, some of these challenges that we're facing. The EPA today don't distinguish among viruses. They say all viruses, this is how much chlorine you need to put to get 99.99% as a regulatory level of protection uh, by the EPA, but they don't specify which viruses are they talking about. Um, and what I'm showing here is two of the uh, enteric viruses that we deal with. Uh, the EPA is considering whether to regulate them individually, adenovirus and Coxsackie virus. One of them is a double-stranded DNA, the other one, uh, adeno, the other one is a single-stranded RNA virus. And I'm giving you the same conditions, uh, experiments that were performed with both of them. To show to you, for example, that all viruses are not equal, if you look at the horizontal axis of each of those figures, is the exposure. You're multiplying the concentration of the disinfectant times the amount of time that you have the virus in contact with the disinfectant. In the vertical axis, what you have is the survival. So if you had 10 to the 0, 1, you didn't inactivate any. If you go to 10 to the minus four down there, that's 99.99% inactivation or 0.01% survival. So what you have there is a survival ratio. So, uh, and uh, the regulation, remember, is four logs. So uh, I did the calculation. Notice that in the horizontal axis, the numbers are quite different, whether you're talking about Adeno and Coxsackie, they're both quite common viruses in, uh, in waters. And, uh, for the fall log inactivation that the EPA requires, let's say at the pH of nine on the high end for the distribution system, the CT, uh, the exposure to uh, uh, free chlorine that you will need, this is free chlorine, is 0.5 milligrams per liter. So if you have one milligram per liter typical dose, in 30 seconds you'll do, so it's actually very effective. What we are going away from right now for adenovirus is a very effective technology is uh, inactivated very quickly. On the other hand, what you have there is Coxsackie virus under the same conditions, but when it goes from 30 seconds to one hour. So there is significant differences in you know, the level of uh, treatment that you're going to have to provide for each of these viruses. Now, this is both of them free chlorine, two different viruses. The EPA may need to start to distinguish between the tough viruses and those that are not so tough. But what happens if we actually combine the chlorine? So that's what you have in the next uh, 
slide here is that uh, the number of zeros in the horizontal axis has gone, you know, it's, those numbers are much larger, right? So now we're talking about to achieve four logs with combined chlorine, adenovirus that used to be very quickly with free chlorine is actually very resistant to combined chlorine. So it went from 30 seconds to 3.5 days. I mean, we're not talking here about small differences. We're talking about many order of magnitude differences in terms of the resistance. Uh, of this virus to uh, two different species of chlorine. So those utilities that are starting to put uh, 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 ammonia to combine the chlorine uh, may actually you know, uh, increase the risk of exposure. Now, it's true that in the treatment plan you can put some free chlorine and then you can put combined chlorine in the distribution system, but you know, we also, also have problems of uh, entrainment and contamination in the distribution system. So what you do in the treatment plan may not necessarily be protecting you. And you can see, you know, that uh, in case of Coxsackie virus, still we're talking about in excess of a day uh, for uh, this, this treatment. Let me give you another example. Uh, if we just go to uh, free chlorine once again, and I'm now talking about a, a bacterium, uh, mycobacterium, is probably one of the most common bacteria detected in distribution systems in the United States and the rest of the world, so it's quite common. And the reason for it is uh, the data that I'm showing here. It actually has one of the strongest changes uh, in dependence on inactivation. So if you are in the summertime in a treatment plan, a low pH, uh, when you're applying, let's say, uh, low pH for enhanced coagulation, uh, for doing three logs, we don't have it regulated, so I'm just doing three logs for calculation purposes, uh, one milligram per liter of chlorine, free chlorine will actually take care of it, the three logs, 99.9% .9 inactivation in one hour. But look what would happen if you actually have in the distribution system, which is where we tend to find it all the time, in the winter time at five degrees Celsius at the pH of nine, a little high end for distribution systems. Three logs, one milligram per liter is 140 days. In fact, free chlorine preserves this pathogen in the distribution system. And it's a pathogen that we're very concerned about and we actually don't know what to do with it because this is really a challenge uh, in terms of uh, um, but you could see that the difference just with one disinfectant that we can, and the, the challenges that we have. I'm not going to go much into this, uh, so I'd like you to just look at the curves that are in black color there. This is using combined chlorine for the same bacteria. And what you have there is that, yes, in the, uh, uh, you know, a high temperature is much more resistant than hours instead of the one hour that we were talking about. Uh, on, but at five degrees Celsius, instead of being 150 days, it's only eight days. Now, this is an academic difference because none of the two is a, is a good way. So mycobacterium is a big challenge, it's, um, and we don't know how to protect uh, the consumer against it in distribution systems yet. So let me just close here with this case by saying that you know, it's, these, these are not simple problems. They're not simple problems when you deal with them from the perspective of protecting against pathogens. And it gets a lot more complicated when we start to think about protecting the public against uh, you know, the chronic effect of disinfection by products. So one thing that we do is, is to do sequential. So in the treatment plan, we put free chlorine. That's going to take care of adenovirus there. Um, it's going to take the iodine to iodate, so you're not going to form iodinate, uh, iodinated uh, disinfection byproducts, uh, and uh, so you could lower the toxicity. So we need to think about, you know, strategies that will allow us to balance, balance the two, but it's never easy to accomplish everything that you want to do. And I, I chose this example just to uh, show you that the EPA has decided not to regulate mycobacterium avium, even if it's a concern, a very serious concern, because they just cannot propose a technology to control it. It grows in distribution systems, and, and uh, we don't know how to stop it uh, from being there. Now, Kevin, you need to tell me if I have enough time for a second case that is a little shorter, or are we, uh, so we have five minutes. Okay, so let me just give you something very quickly here, because I think this is another thing that is fascinating to me. This is where, uh, you know, the public perception comes in. The difference between the United States and Europe, just, uh, just to give you an example that, uh, I was working in France, <clears throat> and there is a new technology that we like to use uh, to control pathogens in water, and it's medium pressure uh, UV uh, lamps. And you know, it's just light, use photons to control the pathogens. And it's something that we like because at the doses that we use it, it doesn't produce many disinfection byproducts. So actually, it's very attractive. You don't get in trouble with disinfection byproducts very much, and you're able to control your pathogens. But 
you know, there is a difference uh, on the United States versus France. In the United States, when we use a UV lamp uh, like this, uh, you know, I'm not going to go too much into the details, but you have a little graph there that shows you the spectra. So it tells you that you actually emit lights at different wavelengths, from low wavelength at 200, between 200 and 240, and then higher than 240. In France, is the red line. France forces the, the utilities to actually put a filter there to remove the low wavelength because the low wavelength do produce some disinfection by products a little bit, transforms your organic matter. So in France, you actually need to use the lamp with the sleeve, meaning you're producing all that energy and then you're killing it. So you're spending a lot of money for nothing. In the United States, we don't care so much about DVP. We're more concerned about the pathogens. So we actually use the black line. We allow uh, the full spectrum of the UV lamp. So let me show you why it's important to take this into account, uh, because when we look at what, you know, if you take filters and you start to look at what each of these wavelengths do, if you go to the green and blue that you have there, the light green and light blue, uh, those are, you know, we're selecting the low wavelength, you will see that the inactivation efficiency is very high, right? This is very similar to what I showed you before, instead of being the concentration of disinfectant in the horizontal axis times the contact time, it's actually the intensity of the light uh, times the contact time, meaning it's actually the dose of light that I'm putting there, very similar concept in the vertical axis is the survival ratio. Remember, we trying to like to have four logs, eh? So what you have here is that if you, have, if you take into account the uh, low wavelength, you're going to go a lot faster. Uh, and then um, if you go to high wavelengths, it's much slower. The black data points that you have there in the middle is what we achieve here in the United States. In France, because they actually say we don't want below 240, you have the triangles, the red triangles there. That's what they get. So in other words, it takes them twice the energy to do the same level of inactivation using exactly the same lamp simply because they're wasting uh, the low wavelength because they feel like they're going to produce some byproducts, transform the organic matter, and they are concerned about doing that. In the US, we don't. So it's kind of interesting how you know, we have those uh, different opinions. So I'm not going to go through that so that I can finish uh, on time here. But uh, the one thing that maybe I, I should say is that I didn't point it out here, but if you look at the uh, pink uh, hex uh, hexagon there, you will see that actually we find that actually they do better than so that the high, the low energy high wavelength do better than the medium so uh, that the 254 nanometer for example so we're actually looking at that strategy to the French saying okay let's not use the below 240 but let's try to do lamps that actually will inactivate the 280 because otherwise you guys are you know having very bad news here so uh, it's interesting once you do an analysis like this that you always uncover something new that you didn't expect to get. It's like uh, low energy UV light is better than higher energy. So 280 nanometer lower energy is better than the 254, the germicidal, uh, in terms of inactivating uh, viruses. So I just thought of giving you this, these two examples, you know, that always challenge us that it's very important that the complexity of controlling, you know, pathogens and providing safe drinking water when you put that on top of also controlling the disinfection by products, what you do to the water, everything else that is there is, is always make us, you know, think uh, even, you know, uh, uh, in, in a way that uh, uh, we actually need to develop a strategies that will allow us to, you know, bring all of the goals of safe drinking water forward. This, you know, this is work that is being done over the years uh, with by many students. I highlighted some of those that are funded by uh, the Institute. Uh, uh, so um, we're very appreciative of that. Some of this work is being produced uh, out of uh, the funding from the Institute. And the collaborators, uh, I also highlighted there are some of the main collaborators that have been working uh, on this project in particular, but in general, uh, over the years. And we're very appreciative uh, for that funding. And thank you very much. Thank you, Benito. So our next, next talk is going to be by uh, Ralph uh, Mosshaga. Uh, Ralph is the engineering manager for Keras Corporation in Peru, Illinois. He's re responsible for developing and implementing capital projects for Keras, providing technical support to all of Keras's manufacturing sites, 
developing and managing the corporate capital budget, and directly supervising Karis's LaSalle site engineering and headquarters building maintenance staff. And in particular, one of the things about uh, Ralph and Karis, they were one of our billion gallon, gallon uh, water challenge winners. And I know that's one of the key things Ralph is going to be talking about today. So Ralph, I'll turn it over to you. So we're going to change gears a little bit here and we've talked a lot about macro scale issues, regulations, uh, mega cities, things like that. We're going to shift gears to kind of the micro scale. So Keras is an industrial manufacturer and we use a lot of water. So uh, over the past five years, we've had an evolution in how we use and, and how we pay for the water. So I'll review some of that. And there's good news there. In fact, this is where the whittling away of uh, our issues comes. Um, you know, the solutions aren't just on the high level, it has to happen at the, the micro level too. So because Keras isn't as well known as the U of I, I'll start with a few slides to give you some information about Keras Corporation. So we're an environmental company, and we produce and supply technologies for water treatment, soil remediation, and air purification. We're 100 years old, actually, this year. And we actually prepared a booklet about our company. If you want to pick one up on the way out on the check-in table, it gives you some of the background on CARES and tells you a lot more about our history. We've got about 400 employees. Um, and we have a strategic plan for growth with an emphasis on innovation, sustainability, and financial stability. That innovation, you know, some of it's in our production processes, some of it's in our products, but it's also in our infrastructure, our, how we manage our utilities, and how we put together programs for our employees. We're the only manufacturers of potassium permanganate in the Western Hemisphere. And our, our competitors for permanganate are now just in China and India. And I've been able to visit most of the factories. Our technology is, is unique. Nobody else uses it. So if, if we're not innovative to solve a problem, it just won't get solved and you have to live with it. So in that respect, we're forced to be innovative and we've, we've embraced that. So here's a few uh, pictures of some of our sites. The Peru is actually just our headquarters, our main manufacturing facilities in LaSalle, Illinois, the second one down on the left. We've got a plant and a facility in, in Spain, and we have some facilities out on the west coast and on the east coast. So we do have a long-term commitment for sustainability. Over the last four or five years, we focused on energy use uh, reduction, and we've actually reduced the energy cost of making permanganate by over 25%, which is a huge number. It uh, goes right to the bottom line. Some of those things that we implemented were, were very innovative. Some of them were just common sense that we never really realized. In any case, we've made a lot of progress there. So we've, we've achieved the energy efficiency award from uh, ACC for five years in a row. And last year, we, we got the Governor's Sustainability Award. So the sustainability isn't just the right thing to do, it's good business practice. By reducing our energy costs by more than 25%, that, that just goes right down to the bottom line. You've got to pay to put this stuff in or do it, but then after you do, then you're saving money every year. And I can tell you that our competitors aren't even close to our energy use efficiency or our greenhouse gas footprint. So let me just tell you about some of our products. Both potassium and sodium permanganate are used in water treatment and wastewater treatment. There's industrial applications. And then an interesting use is in site remediation. The Olympics in 
uh, London a few years ago were built on a brownfield site and they used permanganate to clean up the site. So instead of digging up the soil or trucking it away or incinerating it, you can inject permanganate right there in, in situ and you take care of the contaminants and then you can go on and build your new facilities. Another main product line is uh, a catalyst for air purification. All those rescue masks, say in a hotel or on an airplane, they use our catalyst for uh, CO destruction. And then we also blend phosphates for water treatment systems. So now let's talk a little bit about the water infrastructure in LaSalle. Uh, in 1991, we, we got our old water contract with the city and that kind of came out of a crisis. They had trouble supplying us with water. In fact, that was so bad, we parked a fire truck in the river and pumped water up to the plant for uh, some time until the, we got better solutions. In 91, with the new contract, we actually uh, got a dedicated water line from the water treatment plant to our factory. They uh, put some new well wells in the well field. They built a new water treatment plant. And we cost shared with getting all this infrastructure in place. And so paying for that was, was a bond and, and that was part of our annual agreement. And we did have a fixed price contract that allowed us to use up to 1,400 gallons a minute of water. And <clears throat> we, in principle, should have paid more when we used more. We, we hardly ever did that. Um, but that's kind of where we were. In 2014, the city of LaSalle took the very um, tough political step of rationalizing their water costs. Not only for us, but for everybody in the whole city. Water was really cheap until then. Um, but they were very forward looking and realized that you know, you've got to pay for the cost of providing that utility, not just some token fee to, to have it. So that was a good move by the city. I mean, it was painful for us. We didn't uh, ask for this because it, it resulted in an increase in our water cost. But what we did move to is instead of a fixed price contract, we got a usage-based contract. And that gave us the ability to now look at water conservation projects and they would have a pay payback. You know, if you're gonna pay the same, whether you use it or not, you're not really gonna focus a lot of effort on reducing water consumption. So early in 2014, our water usage was about 1,360 gallons a minute. 2015, just a few weeks ago, we were down to 1,240 gallons a minute. Most of the water we use is for non-contact cooling, so the temperature is the big deal. It's around 63 degrees. So, and I'll talk about some more numbers as we go. Don't walk into the specifics of the numbers. Things change every day in the plant, depending on what's going on in operations, so the water, the water use changes quite a bit. So I tried to be average the numbers and be consistent. So in, in developing our water use reduction plan, I mean really the, the first step is to understand who's using the water and where it's being used. So you need a water balance. <clears throat> For us at that point, we did have a water balance and I'll, I'll show it to you here in a second, but it was mainly calculated. There was very little measurement. In fact, we paid our water bill based on the number that the city gave us, which was fine because it, you know, it didn't change. Now when we're paying based on usage, it becomes a big deal. Within the plant, we had a few water meters so we could distribute the water cost to the users. You know, every product line needs to pay for their own raw materials. So the next step then is to actually meter your water usage. I've heard already several times that uh, what you measure, what you don't measure never gets managed. And, and that's the position we were in. We weren't really measuring it. If you look down on the bottom, it says we had a perception that water is a free utility. That was absolutely the case. One of our plants where we make the catalyst and the sodium permanganate, that capacity increased significantly over the last five or six years. So that meant they had to use a lot more water there was never any consideration of 
why they're, you know, what, why they're using all the water or being efficient with it, you know, we got in trouble when we couldn't provide enough or when the pressure dropped because the usage was too high. So then it's, it's important to understand what are you using the water for. Like I said, a lot of our water was for cooling, non-contact cooling water. Um, so we're looking for temperature and flow rate. We use water for seal water, for pumps. We have some vacuum crystallizers where we need to maintain a seal in the uh, vacuum system. Then we've got plant and process water makeup. And then there's sanitary service. So the last part is you really have to understand and communicate the cost of water. For this year, our water cost is going to be about a million dollars. And, and we've gone a long way in sharing that with operations. You know, we give them a report now every week that says, this is how much you spent on your water. You need to pay attention. <clears throat> and it's, they're, they're big numbers. So here's that water balance I was telling you about. And what I learned yesterday was withdrawal and consumption. On the left side in that little brown box, that's where we put our withdrawal. That's the water that comes from the city. It's 1.96 million gallons a day. On the right side, there's a box that says a little vermilion. That's the water that we're discharging through a cooling pond into the Little Vermilion River. In fact, the river goes right past the city's well field. They have a whole bunch of shallow wells. So I don't know that it's all infiltrating right back down into the wells, but you know, it's kind of a short circuit there. And then you can see all the other little boxes in there. It says, you know, where we are using water that's going to be evaporated as steam, where we have sanitary water. We pick up rainwater on the site. We have to monitor that. So this is, by and large, a calculated uh, spreadsheet based on estimates with a few measurements. So once we started getting a lot more serious about water, then we started looking at, well, let's measure our water usage. And that's where the big eye openers come out. So you can see here that we have one huge user. It's called the, the Keras crystallizer. We actually already measured that water. We knew how, that, how much water that one was using because the flow rate and the temperature affect the performance of that equipment. But you can see down on the bottom, there's a whole bunch of different pieces of equipment. Some of, their, some of them are process. Some of them are cooling water related. And like I said, if you don't measure it, it's invisible to people, and you'll never be able to manage it. So this was really important for us. I can't tell you how many meters that we have in the plant that tell us how much water we're using. We're highly automated. We use uh, Allen Bradley PLCs. We have an HMI. The, the guys run the plant with the computers. All the data that we use is stored in a, a a data historian called Pi, and you'll see some slides of that later. So we can look at anything that's going on in the plant. And by having all this measured utility information, now you have the tools you need to, to manage it. And it's not just water we're, we're measuring. Energy, steam especially, we're, we're measuring that like crazy. Gas usage, uh, air usage, and all those things are, in the past, they were fairly in, invisible. Once you start measuring it, then it becomes visible and then people can see, well, you know, this is something really, we really need to worry about. So this is part of the report that we give to operations every week. It says, you know, we translate it into dollars so it's something they can see and, um, you know, hopefully that helps them manage water usage. So the next part of our plan development and for any plan is to identify some alternatives. Because we're, we're using the water for non-contact cooling, it's not getting contaminated. So there's an opportunity to recycle a lot of this water. There's, there's other alternatives for water instead of raw water. You know, all the steam you generate, some of it you use to make condensate. You know, that condensate can be reused in the plant. And also we, we recycle, I call it weak process water, we call it makeup. There's a cost to that because it's, since it's weak, you've got to spend money to concentrate it. So you spend some money there, but you also not only reduce your water consumption, then you save on raw materials because if there's any raw materials in that water, 
once you concentrate it, then you can reuse them and, and recycle them. In fact, in our permanganate plant, we use a lot of water, but there is no process water discharged at all from the whole site. Anything that falls on the floor gets recycled as weak processed water. We concentrate it and then recycle it. Well, then there's cooling towers. You don't just have to use uh, city water. There's mechanical chillers. And then there's more efficient plant equipment options. We're 100 years old. I wouldn't tell you that all of our equipment is 100 years old, but there's some that's been there for a long time. Some, some of the uh, reactors with, steam, with coils for heating or cooling were designed when the cost of utilities wasn't an issue. So there's opportunities there for more efficient heat exchange equipment, whether you, you switch from a coil to a jacket or a cooling vessel to a heat exchange or even vacuum assisted cooling. There's lots of technologies now that, that make sense, especially when you're measuring your utilities and you can see the impact. We've also looked at process improvements to reduce our cooling water requirement. Some have increased it because we realized that we needed to keep parts of the process cooler, but that's certainly an alternative that you should look at. And then a big deal is controls. Now that you're measuring all this stuff, you have the ability to control it. So water flow through a cooling coil, and you don't just want to turn it on and off. You want to put a, a variable speed drive on that pump measure the temperature you're getting, you're, you're trying to get, and then control the water flow so you get what you're looking for. So the, the next part then is to look at the economics. Of course, you gotta figure out how much it's gonna cost to purchase the equipment, to install it. You, you may have some engineering design. Controls is a big deal, and then you've got installation. Then you need to evaluate the potential savings. If you're measuring your, your water usage, you're, you've got a leg up in coming up with that savings, or you can estimate it. Some of your, your water use reduction projects, though, may end up with increased energy cost. If I put in a chiller, well, now I'm not going to spend much on water, but I'm going to spend a ton on electricity. But if you combine the chiller with a cooling tower, you know, in the winter it gets cold. I won't need to run the chiller. I won't even have to run the fans on the cooling tower. So that energy cost calculation can get pretty complicated and it's worth doing it because it may make the economics of your project. If you just assume you're gonna run that chiller all the time, the economics are gonna look pretty bad. But if you realize that, you know, I only need to run it for three months in the summer and then off and on for a few more months and then I can leave it off, it changes things drastically. Then you need to quantify the other benefits of your water projects. Waste energy reduction. And I'm gonna give you some details on the project we did last year, but we ended up recycling the water coming out of our crystallizer barometric condenser. So when the water comes out of there, it's 20 degrees warmer. That water goes to our boiler water treatment train and then it becomes boiler feed water. Well, so now I got a free 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 20 BTUs per pound that, you know, you, you, it probably doesn't matter that much in the end, but if your economics are tight, you want to make sure you look at everything. And then other water, other benefits are, you, you'll affect your operations and maintenance costs. We've got pretty tight guidelines for economics. We want a two-year payback and a DCF ROI of at least 25%. Capital is a very constrained resource. So I manage all the capital and we're continually balancing, you know, should I use my money to replace, replace a piece of equipment so I can keep operating or implement a cost savings project? Or the roof's falling apart. I need to replace the roof because it rains so much I can't run my equipment. So it's always a balance. Often I struggle getting people to understand that just because a project has a payback, we have to delay it. We can't do it right now. There's only so much money. And so that's all part of the economics. You really have to understand the whole big picture of 
where you are. And when I talk about our, our longer term plan, I'll, I'll show you some of the effects of capital availability. And then project funding. The project that we did last year, we got support from ISTC. The, the economics were good. I might not have been able to do it if we didn't get support because of all the other competing priorities for capital. So those of you that have money available, uh, you know, in, from uh, you know, the government, you know, that may be a, a, a way to help implement water use reduction projects, you know, get something a little bit kicked over the edge of being able to do it. So, you know, it's an important part. Like I said, just because you have capital doesn't mean you can spend it all on water reduction or energy reduction. You've got to balance that with the infrastructure, with the operations, with the process. Um, so it's not always a, a straightforward thing. If you can do something to help tip that balance, it'll make a big difference. So here's our overall plan. Our goal was to identify technically viable projects and evaluate the economics of reducing our water consumption by 50%, which is a huge number. That 50% is about 350 gallons a minute of water, no, 350 million gallons a year of water if we actually achieve that. Now, and in the goal it says identify technically viable projects and then evaluate the economics. Sometimes the project economics aren't very good. So our current situation is, you know, we have the new water contract. It's given us an incentive. And, and the city is, is partners in this with us. They realize that now we have an incentive. We're going to work to reduce our water consumption, so they potentially will have less revenue. The pluses for them are, you know, maybe they don't have to invest in more water infrastructure as quickly. You know, if they've got a marginal well, they might not have to replace it right away. And we also built in minimum usages, so they're, they're completely protected. But we came up with this on a partnership, and you know, you've got to work together with the utilities. You can't just you know, boss yourself around and do whatever you want. It doesn't work that way. So the, the projects that we identified show we could save 750 gallons a minute. It's like two and a half million dollars to implement everything and a total cost or annual savings of about a half a million dollars. So here's some more details on the projects. In 2014, this is a project we actually implemented. So we took crystallizer cooling water and we're recycling it for boiler feed water. The technologies we're doing are recycling and controls. Controls is a really big deal of, of this. And when I give you the details of the project, you'll understand that more. We started up uh, the new equipment at the end of 2014, and we're see, uh, achieving, you know, more than expected water savings, 122 gallons a minute. Uh, the economics came out good, and that 0.8 year payback includes the support we got from ISTC, which was really important in this project. So we had another project on board for 2015. It just didn't make sense in the whole scheme of what we were doing this year. I couldn't. Uh, support it, so we, we pushed it off till next year. It's in next year's budget, and hopefully we'll be able to implement it. But that's, you know, where I was talking earlier about the capital availability, and, you know, just because you're gonna save some money doesn't mean it will or has to happen. There's a lot of other things that take part in that decision. So, um, our project now for 2016, the one that we delayed from last year, uh, we will, um, the, the uh, way the crystallizer cooling water loop works is that water provides seal water to the barometric condenser. It also cools steam vapor coming out of the crystallizer, which creates a lot of vacuum. If we lose water flow to the, to the barometric condenser, that's a catastrophic event because if you lose the vacuum, everything that's in that 100 foot tall tower just drains right out of the bottom. So we have a lot of safeties built into it. One of the safeties is the pump that feeds this system is fed from a tank that's continuously overflowing because I never want to lose suction on that pump. 
So a big part of this project is to change that. We're going to stop overflowing. We're going to put a bigger tank in. Now I'm going to use controls to maintain a level in that tank so it never runs out. I'll put some automation in the valves so that if I think I'm running out of water, I'm going to shut stuff down before I have that catastrophic failure. Connected with this, we have some other cooling water needs that are 20, 30 gallons a minute that will recycle as, as part of this. So we'll save 130 gallons a minute. Uh, the economics are, are okay, 1.8 year payback, it's $180,000 investment. So some of the future projects that we're looking at are that crystallizer cooling loop for the barometric condenser, temperature of that water is critical. We need, you know, 55 to 60 degree water for the equipment to perform properly. If the water gets warmer, we don't get as much vacuum and then it affects our finished products. So instead of using 100% raw city water that's cold, we're looking at a combination of a cooling tower and a chiller. We only pick up 20 degrees in the water, so we think we can use the, the cooling tower and the chiller to make up that 20 degrees. So we'll save 250 gallons a minute. It's got a longer payback. It's um, uh, three years. And then now we're going to have some additional operating cost because we have to run this chiller. The economics include that additional operating cost. So even though the payback's three years, excuse me, three years, it may, it's still a viable project. The next two, the sodium crystallizer chilled water and this uh, 400 feet tank, they, they're both uh, vessels that we cool process liquor. They have uh, significant water savings, but the payback is really long, 14 years for both of them. Just on the surface, it doesn't look like a very viable project. But what I'm doing now is, this is for our sodium permanganate manufacturing process. We're looking at a complete, um, a major expansion of the plant. So maybe we won't revise the existing equipment, but if we expand the plant, now it's an opportunity to build that stuff in from the very beginning, which we may not have thought of, you know, without having this plan as a guide. So let me give you a few more details about the uh, project that we did. So the, all the cooling water that we use is discharged into what we call a plant sewer, goes through some monitoring stations, and we've got to monitor the water in case there's an upset, goes into a cooling pond, and then it drains into the Little Vermilion River. This uh, water recycling project, we, we took some of that non-contact cooling water I told you already about. It feeds our boiler or feed water system. For boiler feed water, we do water softening. We have an RO system to clean up the boiler feed water to reduce operating costs of the boiler, and it's, it's a pretty significant cost reduction putting in an RO system. If you want to learn more about that, I can tell you later. We use uh, some of this water for rectifier cooling. Even though it's, it's uh, 20 degrees warmer, it, it didn't affect our requirement for rectifier cooling, so now that water is free. And then we use it for makeup water in the pump, in the, in the plant. This was actually a pretty simple project, if you look at it. We just need to install a pump, some piping, and automation. Well, the, the piping is pretty long, installing the pump was a big deal, and automation, automation always costs big bucks, because you've got to do it right. So, in order to install the pump, we had to modify the weir box. It required a whole plant shutdown. We had to run the line from that new pump to where it ties into the existing feed water system. We put in controls so that we could manage it. Now we're worried about integrity of water in that weir box, so we had to put in level controls so that if the water gets too low, we know about it so we can deal with it before we, we uh, have that catastrophic failure. And it gets dealt with automatically. Nobody's got to push a switch, but we need to know about it. And then we put in a bypass so that uh, if you are in an upset condition, you go back to the old way. It never hurts you to, to default that way. So this is kind of a real quick process flow. The, the stuff inside the red squiggly line is the new equipment. And like I said, it's, it's pretty simple. 
I mean, the cost comes from all the installation and the piping and everything else. I told you we do a lot of work on controls. This is the screen that the operators actually use to control the plant. So you can see that pump on the bottom, it's green, that means it's running. We got a VFD on it because we want to control the pressure coming out of it. We measure the crystallizer weir box temperature. We also measure the conductivity. Because there is a potential for overflowing the crystallizer and contaminating the water, we don't want to then send that water to the boiler because we'll have to remove all that. So we measure the conductivity. If there's ever an upset, it automatically reverts back. And the other thing we do is, in the top left corner, you can see it's called permissives. I don't know if you can read it. Those are all the things that have to be in place before this system will start. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of that operational integrity that you've got to build into all of these uh, changes. Oops. Okay. My slides are messed up. So we already talked about the critical concerns. Um, the results are that we did save more water than we expected. We got a couple of unexpected results. One is that um, if you've ever seen water, even in your house, cold water running through a pipe, it makes the pipes wet. Usually it's a nuisance, but in the boiler house, you got a lot of pipes with that cold water running through it. That 20 degree increase in temperature is enough so that those pipes don't sweat anymore. It's a huge reduction in maintenance cost. I don't have to insulate the lines. They're not gonna rust away anymore. Um, here's a screenshot of all the data. That top green line is water use to the boiler house and you can see the step change. That's where we started this system up. So in the end, for water conservation at industrial facilities, you've got to understand what the water is used for, who's using it, you've got to measure it, you've got to understand and communicate to everybody the cost of water. Operations really doesn't care. Their mission is to produce. <laughs> so if, if, if uh, water in the end isn't a, a, a high cost raw material, so they're going to do whatever they need to do to, to make the products and look at unique and novel alternatives. The water conservation projects that we've identified and implemented are saving us money, but the overall economics aren't always going to be compelling to do a project. And that's where partner funding, maybe ISTC or other government forms, can help implement stuff that might not have been implemented otherwise. Thanks. Well, thanks, Ralph, for a, uh, a great case study. And now we're going to be moving on to um, hear a little bit from Ed Reitor. Uh, Ed is the Director of Strategic Projects in Dow Chemicals Environmental Technology Center. In this role, he works with Dow businesses and corporate programs to reduce emissions, waste, freshwater intake, and energy use. And Ed and I had a good discussion the other night because both of us, uh, I used to work for Dow Chemical back in ancient times. And uh, it'd be funny to see how many of you remember the company Film Tech. That was a major company that Dow actually purchased in the 80s. And Dow has been very, very active when it comes to water treatment, especially on the industrial side of things. So Ed? Kevin and I share a bit of uh, bit of history. We found out as well uh, because we both had Im been involved in characterizing film tech uh, membranes uh, at one point or another. Well, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, not only for the opportunity to talk with you today, but also to listen to the conversations that have gone over on over the past couple of days. Uh, I think this has been very uh, interesting and useful for me to to really see the broad picture and all the different components of it. I'll talk just a little bit about some of the business solutions that can be uh, used in this space to help us access some of the water that perhaps we're not using, to reuse some of the water that we have available to us, uh, and to uh, provide for more people fresh water that they can use. 
So three messages I want to leave you with, and I'll start with. One is that the freshwater gap is ubiquitous, and it's growing. There are some applications where technology, business solutions, uh, can help. Not all, but some. And third, um, working with those solutions in nature, we can provide some amplified capabilities. Well, as you've heard over the last couple of days, uh, population growth is going to create a number of uh, stressors uh, for us that will be huge. Uh, food, energy, water are all coming our way, and uh, we're already starting to see some of this gap between supply and demand that we've heard about. And business as usual, our common approach, uh, will not be uh, sufficient. One of the things I was just going to briefly point out, I, I thought about taking this slide out, but then I, I put it back in. The cyclic nature of, of water supply um, intersects with population growth. So this uh, blue line that you can see here uh, is water demand, and as that demand grows, it can get to a point where uh, it intersects the available supply. In areas where water is scarce, uh, as long as there weren't a whole lot of people there, there wasn't an issue. Increased population growth and increased usage can create the, the deficit uh, in the availability of water. And we can make that issue worse by taking some of the water out of the supply, water that might, in fact, be impaired. Uh, this shows a map uh, from USGS of, of some of the uh, potential areas, well, the ways in which water has been impaired in the upper left-hand uh, corner, some of the areas we've talked about in the last couple of days, nitrogen and phosphorus, are, are illustrated. The right-hand side is, uh, upper right, is livestock. And on the left-hand side, lower, uh, is atmospheric. So the atmospheric, uh, if I can point that out right down here, uh, is due to coal-fired power plants and others. Air pushes uh, those uh, pollutants, mercury, other metals, east, and that's the reason why there's contamination in, in the northeast. The composite picture uh, shown in the lower right shows the water that is not fit for the uses which we might want to use it for. Some additional purification might be need, needed uh, in that case. So stewardship and behavior modification here uh, is really important for us to change that situation. We heard in the last couple of days about uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, from food crop production. One of the solutions that wasn't mentioned, I'll just briefly illustrate, and that is that some ways to improve uh, nitrogen retention uh, within the soils. So there are additives that you can put in the soils, uh, actually that help the, uh, the roots uh, to retain that, that nitrogen. One of the inhibitors that Dow AgriSciences makes uh, is called Inserv, um, and this has been approved for corn, wheat, sorghum for a number of years, uh, and it's something that, that has been used, is being used uh, here. Uh, it's also used in Iowa, and Iowa found that one of the things that they could do to uh, decrease the amount of nitrogen ending up in the water supplies uh, is to use this nitrification inhibitor. Uh, and the incentive that they put out there is $3 per, per acre. Now, they have other uh, incentives, other uh, procedural uh, things that they would suggest, but this is one of the few cases uh, of uh, nitrogen inhibition uh, that's being promoted in this, in this way. Now, water scarcity uh, is a risk to uh, the businesses, and businesses have certainly seen this, this risk. Uh, in trying to mitigate it where we can. The big users, as we've, we've heard about, is agriculture, municipalities, uh, and municipalities, frankly, are going to be number one uh, in the water supply. Nobody's going to cut off the mun municipalities. Uh, agriculture, well, uh, who wants to go without food? Uh, that's going to be really hard to constrain as, as well. Industry has options, and I'll talk about some of those options, as well as the solutions we can provide in the next couple of slides. Well, concerns here fall into several different categories. We've heard about quantity. We've heard a little bit about quality uh, as well. Um, and I'll also point out that there's, there's certainly an intersection here between quantity uh, and quality. So in rivers, 
such as uh, in South uh, Texas, where we have our, our largest production facility south of, of Houston. When the water supply is really low in the Brazos River, that hurts us both ways. It hurts us from a quantity perspective. that We don't have enough to uh, take into our process facilities for cooling. At cooling, of course, you would expect in the summertime, you need more cooling. So when there's less water in the river, that's, that's a real problem. But the other part is that when there's less water in the river, uh, it tends to be higher in contaminants. There's less flush coming by in the river. There's more suspended solids. There's higher organic content. Uh, and that creates an, a number of different challenges. Well, I mentioned that business sees uh, the water risk. Uh, and in fact, we see it from several different ways. One is that uh, the manufacturing need for water has been predicted to go up some 400 percent. Uh, conversations about water are at the board level in more than 60 some percent of corporations. Big, big issue, we get it. So some of the things that industry are, are doing, uh, as Ralph mentioned, relative to the recycle, is seeing what we can do to enhance our ability to recycle not only our own water, but other people's water. The Dow Water and Process Solutions here has a target of at least one industry a breakthrough collaboration uh, project by 2025 uh, in water reuse. Collaboration here is an important word just to underscore. In many of these cases, it requires a, a partnership, especially in a really large uh, industrial use situation. You want to take water from um, a, another industry that's near you. You want to take water from communities. Uh, collaboration is really important. And one of the things that's essential here is to get out of the box and do some things courageously that you may not have done before. Uh, second, there's ability to uh, reduce your fresh water intake, and Ralph illustrated that very well. Uh, this is something that's very important. It's the fresh water that's really important because that's uh, constrained relative to use from municipalities and, and agriculture. And the third is to close the loop where you can on water. So several different ways that this is being done. One is to uh, reclaim water that uh, hadn't been used before, that it had just gone through the run of the river. One of the ways we're using this is uh, taking waste, uh, wastewater treatment waste that's been cleaned up, and we'll use that for uh, circulation water, cooling water uh, in various um, uh, industrial facilities. We'll take gray water. Uh, we'll take uh, water from other industrial consumers uh, and use that. That feeds into our process facilities. We'll also recycle our own water within the facilities, sometimes three to maybe even five times, although there are some limits to that relative to the chemistry of the, of the water itself. Now, once we've finished with the water, there certainly are outfalls from our facilities. Some uh, organizations uh, can actually reuse that water. There's been some cases where it's been used for agriculture. It can go back to uh, municipalities in the wastewater treatment facilities. Uh, others can use it for, for cooling uh, and other sources as well. Well, it's not as simple as that. You, ha you have to clean the water up. One of the challenges with, uh, with recycle uh, is that things build up over time, and you can get scale build up. Uh, you can get corrosion of uh, metal parts, uh, and uh, you can get biofouling. Biofouling is, is one of the big detriments in this space. Now, uh, you can certainly put biocides in there, but biocides um, ha have other issues, as, as we heard in the first talk. Uh, there can be uh, contaminants and other things that, uh, that occur uh, from that. Uh, now, Dow is not only a big water user, but we're also a provider of solutions that can help others to, to clean up their water supplies. We have a pretty wide range of water uh, solutions. We have reverse osmosis, um, we have ultrafiltration, we have fine particle filters, uh, ion exchange res resins, um, and resins that can help people fix leaks in pipes and can uh, have pipes be more reliable. So there's several different sets of solutions. I'll mention a couple here. One of the things that Dow Water and Process Solutions has done is continued to innovate uh, in the membranes themselves. 
those innovations have allowed the membranes to do their work at lower pressure. Lower pressure means lower energy, and lower energy means uh, savings to the bottom line for our users, uh, as well as several other uh, important impacts, which I'll mention in just a minute. But if you look at the historical drop in energy uses from RO membranes, you can see that 60% uh, reduction is where we're at today versus 1995. Um, and also, uh, it's important that we've um, cut down on the amount of salt that ends up in the really brackish uh, effluent, or what I'll call the reformate. So what kind of impact has that 64% reduction had? Um, Ashlyn mentioned yesterday the connection between energy and water. Well, to put it on an energy scale, that's 37 million barrels of, of oil that has been saved by the people using these membranes. Uh, additionally, 206 million tons of uh, CO2 uh, have been saved by that reduction. So it can have consequential impacts uh, that are beneficial uh, in several other different areas. So let me give you a couple of examples from uh, the production facilities uh, globally that we have. Dow's got over 160 production facilities around the globe, some 52,000 people working in those facilities. Uh, I'm going to mention two. Uh, one is in uh, Tunis in the ne Netherlands. The second one is in uh, Sea Drift, Texas. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, this facility at the end of the river, um, we use about 22 uh, million uh, meters cubed uh, per year. That's, that's a huge uh, amount of, of water. Um, several different sources of that water uh, you can see on the, on the pie chart here. Um, the one in green I'll call your attention to. The one in green called Biesbosch water is heavily relied on by municipalities upriver uh, and by um, agriculture. Now, Dow's uh, feed for this is, is substantially upriver, so we find ourselves in a competitive situation. And as population has grown and municipalities have needed more of this water and agriculture has needed more of this water, uh, we've looked for ways to reduce our usage. Uh, of this water. So one of the things that we've done is we've, we've hooked up to the local municipal wastewater treatment plant and we're taking uh, 10,000 meters cubed uh, of energy uh, every 24 hours. We're purifying that, we're using that in our facilities to generate steam. Um, that's reduced 5,000 tons uh, a year of greenhouse gases. Uh, and it's reduced the energy demand by some 65% for that, that water source. Now, one of the other things that we've done is we've looked at the, at the uh, choices that uh, can be made between what I'll call gray infrastructure and green infrastructure. So several years ago in Sea Drift, we had, we had a choice. We needed to replace the wastewater treatment plant, uh, and that was going to be fairly expensive. Uh, at that point, we looked at something that was out of the box, was something that would have been courageous uh, at that time. And we said, well, the water's pretty clean. We just need final polishing. What can we do? Uh, so we explored the idea with uh, several collaborators in that space, uh, NGOs included, uh, as to developing a, a wetlands. Uh, the wetlands won out, and the wetlands has been very, very successful in purifying the water it also saved uh, the hardware cost, which were $280 million, uh, and it provided, in addition to the current uh, wildlife refuge that, refuge that was there, it allowed an expansion of that wildlife refuge that has provided a habitat, an ecosystem uh, expansion, if you will, for fish, and alligators, raccoons, and, and other. And of course, uh, what's the operational cost of running the wetlands? Zero. We, we have no operational overhead for running that, that wetlands. And that has been a real success story for us. We've looked to expand this now in, in other locations uh, around the globe. Uh, well, that was, our, that was our introduction, a little bit of an aha moment, uh, if you will, that showed us that, well, working with nature, we can save, save capital. We can save energy. Um, and we can provide a habitat for nature at the same time. We've continued to work with the Nature Conservancy 
uh, looking for ways to uh, improve the decision-making process so that nature is part of the decision conversation uh, as we think in hardware product projects. Uh, we've also now opened the door uh, considerably for green infrastructure projects. So uh, we have some, some real conservation momentum uh, in this place. And one of the big challenges, uh, Ralph mentioned, uh, net present value and the way the decisions are made in a corporate environment. Typically, you've, you've got 10 years to realize the, the payback. And the typical uh, target uh, in our camp is 30% uh, is, is uh, in PV. That's, that gets you to the discussion phase. However, projects such as a new polymer or something else have an enviable net present value of usually over 50%. So how are you going to compete with that? So one of the things that we've been trying to do is to evaluate and value the eco ecosystem services, uh, these energy reductions, the greenhouse gas savings, and anything else we can throw into the, uh, the pile relative to uh, the economics. One of the other things that Dow has, has done historically uh, is to set sustainability goals. So the first uh, big set of those was in 2005. Uh, those were landmark goals for, for Dow uh, and led to huge savings uh, in energy, uh, as well as savings to the bottom line that totaled over that time period a billion dollars. Uh, in 2015, we had another set of goals and just a few months ago, we announced the new 2025 sustainability goals, of which there are several elements. I'll highlight a few that relate to, to water. The first one I'll, I'll mention is a specific goal on the circular economy. So we have, as I mentioned, some targets to do collaborative projects on the circular economy that are big, that are, big, that are innovative, and can teach us some things we don't know today. Second, I'll mention is uh, valuing nature, which is right in the center uh, of all of these, these goals, because we, we can see that it's good business to work with nature, to provide solutions, to provide uh, ecosystems, to provide the ability for nature to provide us with the services that we also use. And I'll also mention one here, the world leading performance. We've seen some elements of that in the recycle use in Ternus and, uh, and sea drift. Three goals specific to water that I'll mention. By 2025, we're targeting six major circular economy goals. Uh, that's very aggressive. I mean, we, 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 we've had um, the one in sea drift, and, and that took a number of years to put into place. Collaborations, partnerships, public-private partnerships are really going to be important to this. Uh, really out on a limb on the second one, delivering a, a billion dollars in value through the projects uh, that are good for, for ecosystems. And the third is reducing the freshwater intake um, at key water stress sites by 20%. So amongst all Dow's uh, sites that use water uh, globally, there are some that use water that are in water stressed. Uh, water basins, and those are the ones that we're specifically targeting to reduce this um, intake uh, of water. So I've tried to give you um, a bit of a highlight from the industrial perspective, how we see water, how water is really uh, an important part, and how the things that we can hear from the conversations that you have and the way that industry can be involved uh, are very, very important. So let me stop there and I'll pass it on. We have probably about uh, roughly five or so minutes for questions for uh, any of our speakers. So thank you all of the really uh, interesting presentations. Um, I have a question primarily, um, maybe pose it to Ralph and Ed, um, uh, but more in generally as well. Um, you know, you both brought up this issue about looking at the economic costs and benefits of making any of these environmentally friendly uh, technology changes, which of course sort of validates the core hardcore economist view of how, uh, you know, businesses make decisions as if it benefits the bottom line. Um, but, you know, to what extent 
Uh, do you think there are alternative views out there? Uh, and so I guess I'm, I'm wondering to what extent there might be other sort of non-economic or not so explicitly economic factors that might also be influencing decision making. For example, uh, you know, there's of course implicit costs of regulations, dealing with regulators, there is issues of, you know, reputation, public recognition, and so on. Um, so to what extent those might play a role? Uh, and then, you know, um, Ed, you mentioned that you actually, Dow actually uh, tries to put values on this, and presuming sort of monetary values. To what extent are those explicit values, implicit values? How do you derive those values? Uh, I think it just would be fascinating to hear a little bit more on that. Okay, well, Madhu, uh, very good question. Um, yeah, it's a real challenge moving from the idea of evaluating nature and the decision process that you think is right to the point of uh, competing with uh, hard capital projects. Because in the end, you have to argue for the same amount of, of money and the capital budget uh, is small. Uh, it's an evolutionary process. Where we're at today is trying to evaluate how much value the ecosystems provide in monetary terms. So we have to, we have to put it in dollar terms just like we do for other, other projects. Uh, and then we look to evaluate those or to validate those with people uh, inside as well as outside the company uh, on various occasions. So I think the current set of goals will provide uh, additional challenges. The fact that we've got the goals actually authorized and there's a, a large nature goal associated with the others, I think that's our first win. Uh, the next challenge is to continue to see if we can have projects that compete favorably um, win when it gets into the capital discussions. Uh, speak, uh, keep the uh, microphone up because my question comes to, to you. On your slide eight of your presentation, with the global map of uh, uh, the water availability in different regions of the world, and I assume that the more red there was, the, the more severe water shortage. And the Middle East area, you know, Arabia, Iran, Kuwait, you know, you know, Persian Gulf, they were completely red. My question to you is that if dark chemical company invests as a cost-sharing project in regions of the world that there is water issues, how much this water availability goes into your decision, the business decision-making process? Because I think you guys are doing a, a huge petrochemical project in Saudi Arabia, I think. Yeah, the, the answer to your question, the question is, how much does water scarcity come into a decision as far as uh, investments? And where are you gonna build your next project? Um, and specifically, you mentioned the Sadara project in Saudi Arabia, which is probably the largest petrochemical uh, complex in the world. That decision was made probably some 10 years ago uh, at this point, before we see the current environment, but of course we knew that water was scarce uh, in that environment. Uh, I think it's becoming more um, a larger component of the decision-making process that uh, just like we heard a couple days ago, uh, as people said, for developers, when you bring a development project to an area like California or other some place that's water stressed, you have to bring the water with you. Uh, I think it's getting to that point in the chemical industry as well that people will ask the question, all right, well, it looks like you got all the raw materials, you got the economics justified, do you have the water supply, and do you have a water supply that's not gonna compete with agriculture and municipalities? Um, so I think that's the future in, in the present context. What are we doing about um, the investments that we've made in areas with really high uh, water stress? Uh, some of the things that are being done in Saudi is a high rate of recycling uh, where possible. Uh, we also are using the membranes that I talked about to reduce the energy load. Uh, people may say, okay, well, Saudi Arabia, you really don't need to worry about energy, right? That's uh, not quite true. Uh, you need to worry about energy because not only does it impact energy, but again, of course, it impacts water and greenhouse gases. Uh, so we are 
uh, having probably our largest membrane install actually in Saudi Arabia for that project. So to answer your question, it's part of the story. Um, probably wasn't part of the story 10 years ago, but it's definitely part of the story now and in future years. I, I also have a, a question from our last speaker, not related to body, but if we are uh, extracting natural gas or whatever from the fracking at the rate we are doing today, how many more years can we have access to that gas? Is it 50 years, 100 years, or 10 more years? Because a lot of people are depending on that natural gas from fracking for industrial uh, usage, right? And what is the best estimate? How many more years do we have gas there? Well, I don't think I have a direct answer to your question. You know, the only thing that I can comment on that is that, uh, you know, uh, with the introduction of new technologies, uh, especially I mentioned that shift of uh, to horizontal uh, drilling and hydraulic fracturing. I mean, uh, this can extend for at least another thirty <coughs> four years. So, but again, I don't have I don't have a, a direct answer to your question. Um, this question is for uh, Julio or Ralph or Ed. Um, the challenges you're facing in the private sector are extraordinary. They, they, they may transcend the educational background of a traditionally trained uh, engineer or MBA or chemist. And so as folks uh, representing the private sector and future employers, um, what, what would you say to this generation of undergraduates? What, what would you like to see in their training uh, as an undergraduate that, that, that you wish you had had or that you uh, would like to see the next generation of undergraduates coming through have that would make them better able to face these really complex challenges? Okay. Well, I, I guess I'll go first and then uh, pass it on down the line. Uh, I would say one is uh, a broad perspective um, that you bring in not only the engineering capabilities that uh, you have relative to the training, but you also look at sustainability, economics, um, and life cycle assessment. So the life cycle assessment will come in relative to the sustainability perspective. Uh, you have to think about, well, what are the, the downstream uh, impacts that could have an impact? Uh, how could you sense what those challenges are? And in other words, detection, and then what's your, your response? So in the engineering camp, one of the tools that's used is something called FMEA which is failure modes and effects analysis. It's long range thinking. Uh, what could be the consequences of what you're trying to do? What's your ability to detect those consequences and what's your response? Thinking about those things long term is really good. Similar sustainability and life cycle assessment in a broad perspective is something that incorporates all those. The other thing I'd add to that is when I interview potential engineers, you know, I'm assuming that the education is pretty substantial. What I really want like to look at is what else have they done? Have they had internships that have very different exposure for them? What else have they done while they're going to school? If they're just sitting there with their books and not getting involved in other activities, then, then you get a more focused, narrow-minded, maybe, uh, individual. So you really have to be broad and think out of the box and try and get exposure that gives you those insights. Yeah, I, I will agree with that. I mean, we definitely value a lot whenever somebody has a previous experience and maybe a summer internship or things like that. And, and you know, I mean, to be honest, we look for all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of engineering backgrounds. Um, Pretty much our training is pretty intensive, even if you don't have any petroleum engineering background, in six months to a year, you have that background array, right? Even So if you're a civil engineer, uh, a mechanical engineer, whatever, I mean, our, our training is pretty intensive on that. So I would say just having a, a strong engineering background is a plus. If I, if I could just build on that just a little bit, the other thing I would mention is the ability to solve problems. When you got a great tool set coming out of school, the challenge is to uh, find ways to use that to engage others in solving the problem. So the others part of that, uh, I'll extend. 
you, you come out of school typically with a skill set in a, a fairly narrow box. But being able to work with others that have experience in areas that are tangential to yours is, is really important. If we find that innovation oftentimes occurs at the intersection between fields. A really good book uh, that you might think about looking at is called The Medici uh, Effect by a guy by the name of John Erickson that talks about innovation at the intersection of fields. One last thing that I wanted to add to all of that is the idea of ownership. Unfortunately, not all of the stuff you'll do as an engineer is going to work right out of the box. You can't just then turn it over to somebody else to fix. That's a big negative. So having that ownership of your work and keeping it until it works right is, is a big deal. Not everybody coming out of school understands that or even is willing to go that far. So that's an important trait that people have to have. So I have a, first of all, I really enjoy learning from your talk. I have a question to add and the Julio, um, because both uh, Halliburton and uh, Dahl uh, have a, a factory or site in a place like Texas. And if we look at the uh, uh, climate a uh, couple of decades down the road, and the days with temperature more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, could be increased by 50% or e possibly double. And that means uh, during those days, uh, you probably have a high demand on energy or um, water. Uh, would that kind of a uh, uh, scenario influence business decision of the company? Uh, yeah, I'll uh, take it first and then hand it off to you. Um, a kind of long range perspective uh, is very important. One of the discussions I had yesterday, we talked about uncertainty versus risk. Um, in uncertainty, you can think about the fact that there's well, there's lots of there's pretty big error bar in some of the modeling that you might do, in some of the ways you might look at it, because we aren't certain of a particular result. But the risk, however, uh, can still be seen to be very large, even when the uncertainty is fairly small. So if there's a 2% chance that we're going to run out of water at our largest production facility, that's a huge risk. So I think some of the things that we're doing long term to mitigate that risk are things such as improving our resilience. So we're moving off of the water supply where we can that are, are used by others. Um, recycle circular economy is a, a part of that. Uh, I think long term uh, you may see different choices in where people put facilities. And typically they've been put in the facilities uh, okay, close to the customer, close to transportation, close to the raw materials. Um, water is going to be an important part of that decision making process going down the road uh, as well as the, as the climate uh, and the cooling capacity of facilities. Not there yet, but and certainly that's on the horizon. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not really sure if I understood the question, but I mean, I, I just uh, one comment that I want to add is uh, for hydraulic fracturing, the water is actually supplied by by operators, right? In my case, uh, I, uh, for for an oil service company, so a lot of times we have to work also together with uh, with chemical companies. For example, Dow a lot of times provides a filtration uh, a means for the water, so it's. In a way, we're working together, operators, service companies, and chemical companies to provide a good quality water for hydraulic fracture. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. Huh? Well, at this point, uh, I'll close out our session and uh, turn it over to, I guess, Evelyn Meduth.